Chapter Twelve. Which dreamed it? Your Majesty shouldn't purr so loud. Alice said, rubbing her eyes and addressing the kitten respectfully yet with some severity. You woke me out of oh, such a nice dream, and you've been along with me, Kitty, all through the Looking Glass world. Did you know it, dear? It is a very inconvenient habit of kittens. Alice had once made the remark. That whatever you say to them, they always purr. If they would only purr for yes and mew for no, or any rule of that sort, she had said, so that one could keep up a conversation. But how can you talk with a person if they always say the same thing? On this occasion, the kitten only purred, and it was impossible to guess whether it meant yes or no. So Alice hunted among the chessmen on the table till she had found the Red Queen. Then she went down on her knees on the hearth rug and put the kitten and queen to look at each other. Now, Kitty, she cried, clapping her hands triumphantly. Confess that was what you turned into, but it wouldn't look at it. She said when she was explaining the thing afterwards to her sister. It turned away its head and pretended not to see it, but it looked a little ashamed of itself. So I think it must have been the Red Queen. Sit up a little more stiffly, dear. Alice cried with a merry laugh, and curtsey while you're thinking what to, what to purr. It saves time, remember. And she caught it up and gave it one little kiss, just in honor of having been a red queen. Snowdrop, my pet. She went on, looking over her shoulder at the white kitten, which was still patiently undergoing its toilet. When will Dinah have finished with your white majesty? I wonder. That must be the reason you were so untidy in my dream, Dinah. Do you know that you're scrubbing a white queen? Really, it's most disrespectful of you. And what did Dinah turn to? I wonder. She prattled on as she settled comfortably down with one elbow in the rug and her chin in her hand to watch the kittens. Tell me, Dinah, did you turn to Humpty Dumpty? I think you did. However, you'd better not mention it to your friends just yet. For I'm not sure. By the way, Kitty, if only you'd been really with me in my dream, there was one thing you would have enjoyed. I had such a quantity of poetry said to me, all about fishes. Tomorrow morning you shall have a real treat. All the time you're eating your breakfast, I'll repeat the walrus and the carpenter to you, and then you can make believe it's oysters, dear. Now, Kitty, let's consider who it was that dreamed it all. This is a serious question, my dear, and you should not go on licking your paw like that, as if Dinah hadn't washed you this morning. You see, Kitty, it must have been either me or the Red King. He was part of my dream, of course, but then I was part of his dream too. Was it the Red King, Kitty? You were his wife, my dear, so you ought to know. Oh, Kitty, do help to settle it. I'm sure your paw can wait. But the provoking kitten only began on the other paw and pretended it hadn't heard the question. Which do you think it was? A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky. Echoes fade and memories die. Autumn frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me, phantom wise. Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. Children yet the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, dreaming as the summers die. Ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam, life—what is it but a dream? The end.